All right, welcome everyone. My name is Ellen Barra, and I'm with our Provider Outreach and Education Department of WPS Government Health Administrators. With me on the call today is my friend and colleague, Mary Muko, who is going to be monitoring our chat for us. Today, we're going to be talking about the Medicare telehealth guidelines. So, the first thing that we need to show you is our disclaimer, and we do use this with all of our presentations. We're providing this education as a tool for you today. However, as you're aware, Medicare rules do change often. The CMS rules and regulations, the information published on their website is the final determinant of coverage. We will provide responses to the questions based on how you have asked that question, but Medicare rules again will determine that final coverage. And then CMS does prohibit recording of the presentation for profit making purposes. So if you're doing screenshots, if you are recording this, we would ask you to stop. We are recording this today, and this will be available on our YouTube channel. And then also on our Encore page on our website. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, we're gonna talk about the originating site and how to receive payment for that. We're gonna talk about geographic locations, the codes that go along with telehealth services, and then other requirements for those. The next slide that we have for you is the acronyms that are throughout this presentation. I like to gather these all up in one spot for you. Um, so if you need to reference one of them, they're all kind of there together. So let's start talking about the originating site. Well, the originating site, you can bill for this procedure code when the patient presents at your location. So what we're talking about here is the patient is comes into the outpatient department of the hospital, into an office setting, et cetera. Um, and that facility or that location then can submit for that Q3014 procedure code. Now, in olden times, I guess you could say, the patient needed to be presented to that distant site practitioner by a medical professional. However, Medicare no longer requires that. The determination of whether you need to have that patient actually presented will be made by that distant site practitioner. The entity has to be able to submit claims to Medicare. Um, during the public health emergency and still continuing now, there were a lot of different locations that were making their uh, Wi-Fi, their uh, internet access available to patients such as libraries. That was just one of the ones that I heard about. Obviously, that entity cannot enroll with Medicare, so they would not be able to submit that claim. This can be billed by physician's offices, rural health clinics, federally qualified health clinics. Um, there is some information on the Health and Human Services website that shows an RHC or an FQHC can only use this code if the patient is presenting for behavioral or mental health. However, CMS is not supporting that particular statement. And again, patients can present from multiple different locations, but you can build this procedure code if you are enrolled with Medicare. And then the last information we have there is the allowance for 2024. So the originating site, we have all of this, the particular sites listed here for you. Um, other locations can obviously be used, but these are the ones that can actually submit um, for that procedure code to Medicare. The geographic location, currently, the patient can be located anywhere. They don't have to be in a rural area. 
Um, they don't have to be outside of a met metropolitan statistical area. They can be located anywhere. This includes their home. It includes the library, like we talked about before. If they're sitting in the McDonald's and using McDonald's Wi-Fi, uh, that's a, also a location that can be used. This is permanent for behavioral and mental health services, meaning that that's not going to change. For other services, this is considered provisional, and it is effective as of right now through the end of 2024. That would be dates of service 1231-2024 and prior. We'll have to watch the CMS Medicare physician fee schedule proposed and final rule to uh, find out whether or not CMS is going to make any changes to that. The procedure codes that can be used for telehealth are a CMS list, and we're actually going to go to that here in just a second. CMS maintains the list and they do annual updates. Now, during the public health emergency, that document changed quite often. Um, but as of right now, those updates will be made manually, and they are part of that uh, proposed rule and then also part of that uh, final rule that CMS publishes. The list will also indicate whether or not audio only is allowed. And then it will indicate whether it is permanent or provisional. CMS on their website does not maintain an archive list. So it's only the current list that is actually showing on the CMS website. What we have here for you is a picture, um, just a, a section of that list. And you can see it's got the procedure code, the short descriptor of that code. The next column then shows whether audio only interactions meet the requirements for telehealth. And obviously no means you can't and yes means you can. And then we have the section on category. So under that section on category, you can see several of those there are provisional, meaning that through the end of 2024, these can be allowed as telehealth services. And then you'll notice that last one on the page is considered permanent, which means that that service will continue to be allowed as telehealth, barring any changes from CMS, um, continue to be uh, a telehealth service. Now, I'm going to stop sharing this screen real quick, and I'm going to... Um, go out to our, actually to the CMS website and show you how to find this list. The easiest way that, that you have to find this list is actually to go into the search function and you just do a search under telehealth and then scroll down, that second listing is the list of telehealth services, and there it is, kind of right in the middle of the screen. Now, you'll notice that this is a zipped file. So when you open that, you will have to have zipped software in order to do that. I always open the Excel file. I just find that that one's easier, but there is a PDF file there for you too. We'll give it here just a second to open. So you can see there then uh, all of the listing of the procedure codes. So for an example, then if we wanted to do a search, you can just do a control F or control F. Oh, okay. And what I'm looking up is the annual wellness visit. So we can see here then that the annual wellness visit is on the telehealth list. Audio only can meet the requirements and it is a permanent addition to the telehealth list. Now, again, I wanna remind you that permanent is based on anything that may happen within that proposed rule and the final rule going forward. 
um, these of course have been changed. One of the questions that we had is, can we divide these up into specialties or something like that? And the answer to that is no, it is only based on the procedure code and you can go in and you can do that control find. You also here can do a sort or use your filter and we could do the same thing. Let's do this cover. And then it only comes back with that one procedure code that we're looking for. So this again is the annual wellness visit, the subsequent one. Ellen? Yes. Ellen, I'm sorry, we are not seeing your Excel spreadsheet. Okay, let me stop this. Hang on a second, sorry about that. No, first one. Okay, thank you, Mary. Are you seeing it now? We are, thank you. Okay, so let me take off the filter. Okay, so we, you know, we saw how to get to this. I did a control F and did a search under the GO438, and we can see this is the annual wellness visit. You can do it audio only, and it is considered permanent. You also can use your filters, this little box right next to the HixPix listing. And then you can go in and you can put in a specific procedure code. So the procedure code I put in was the subsequent AWV. And the same thing, you can see this is audio only. It is considered a permanent addition um, to that telehealth list. So I'm going to stop sharing this and then we'll go back to our uh, PowerPoint. So Mary, can you see the PowerPoint? I can. Okay. So, you know, as you can see that information um, is continuous and it's for all of the different procedure codes that are on this list. So if you use that control F function, control find, or you use that uh, filter and your procedure code does not come up on this list, that means that it is not on the telehealth list and you would not be able to receive reimbursement when you're doing this through telehealth. So next let's talk about your technology. Well, for your technology, it does have to be two-way interactive audio video. Now for Alaska and Hawaii, if you're in a telehealth demonstration site, you can use asynchronous technology. And what that means is that you can record that patient and then you can transmit that recording to the distant site practitioner but it is only for those the, where the patient is located. It's only for those two states. And, if it, and it's only if that location is within that telehealth demonstration site. If you have that situation, then you would append that modifier GQ. For your audio services, it has to be two-way interactive audio. Um, again, this is permanent for your behavioral and mental health services. It's provisional for other services. The platform that you're using, either through audio or through audio video, has to be health insurance portability and accountability or HIPAA compliant. And that means that it has to ensure the privacy of that interaction, uh, just like any other service. In addition to that, the patient has to consent um, to the service unless, um, unless the service requires a specific consent. The patient must allow you to submit the claim and to receive the payment. You don't need to have a specific consent each time that you do a telehealth, but you do have to have it on file. Again, unless it's a specific type of service, um, there are certain services that you can provide 
um, where the service is not necessarily inpatient and you are in person rather, and the patient needs to be made aware of the cost sharing of that service. For telehealth services, you don't have to have a specific telehealth consent from that patient. Other provisional services um, include hospice care eligibility certification. The hospice medical director can perform this recertification for continued hospice care through telehealth. Now, this presentation is not going to go through the acute hospital care at home program. This is an individual waiver for hospitals with a CMS certification number. There is a link in the CMS Medicare Learning Network Matters 901-705 Telehealth Services where you can get more information on that. And we do have a link to that MLN article in the resources at the end of our presentation. So now let's talk about the distance site practitioner. Well, the distance site is where the physician or practitioner or other qualified healthcare professional is located when they're actually providing the service. This could be an office setting. It could be the practitioner's home. This is the address that you're going to include in box 32 of the CMS 1500 form or in the electronic equivalent on the 837P electronic submission. This location determines the, the Medicare administrative contractor to which you're going to submit your claim. For an example, the patient, or I'm sorry, the physician is located in Kansas, but the patient is in Texas. Well, for this situation, the MAC for this service would be us, would be WPS, Government Health Administrators, as were the MAC for jurisdiction J5, which includes, includes Kansas. If you provide services for multiple locations, then you need to enroll all of those locations with your MAC. Um, so if you're a provider, that you live in Kansas from March through October, but then November through February, you provide services from Texas, then you will need to enroll with both of those MACs, both WPS, Government Health Administrators, and then Novitas, which is the MAC for Texas. CMS is aware um, of issues that providers are reluctant to show their home address as their practice location because their practice locations are published. However, CMS has provided a way that you can suppress the specific address from appearing on the Physician Compare website. Now that Physician Compare website is part of Medicare.gov where the beneficiaries can go to find providers. There's an indicator on the 855 B as in B as in boy form. And if this is checked, this will only show your city and state. It won't show your actual address. You can submit a change of information request through PECOS or through a paper form. You can indicate that if you want this removed. If you have checked this indicator and made these changes and your home address still appears, you would need to contact the CMS Quality Payment Program or QPP Help Desk. And I'm gonna give you that um, email address and it is qpp at cms.hhs.gov. The next thing that you want to think about is your licensure for the location where you're providing services and where that patient is located when you're providing services. Some states during the public health emergency had reciprocal agreements 
to recognize your license in another state. You will need to check with that state, wherever the patient's located, um, in order to determine if they still have that in place or what you need to be, what you need to do in order to be licensed with that state to provide care to the patient in that other state. And we do have a reference for you in the resource section. The next thing that we want to talk about are telehealth and consultations. Normally, Medicare does not pay for consultations. However, we do pay for consults that are provided through telehealth. Now, the documentation that would be needed for that is the request from that um, originating provider, the need for the distant site practitioners additional expertise in order to take care of that patient. And that request does have to be for advice or opinion. This is not a referral. A referral situation that provider who's um, doing that service is just going to bill a regular evaluation and management service. If it is a consult, though, then uh, the consult codes can be used. CMS does have different procedure codes for the consultation services, and these are located within the HICS-PICS book and in the IOM section on telehealth. And that IOM section is linked within your resource section of this document. So the patient location for 2024, we don't have a restrictions. Before the public health emergency, patients must have been in rural areas outside of a metropolitan statistical area or an MSA. These flexibilities were determined during the PHE. Um, for right now, for 2024, there are no restrictions. So the patient, again, can be anywhere. Um, the patient does not have to be in a location that can bill for an originating site fee. So again, they could be in their home, um, they could be sitting in their driveway, they could be at the library, what we have talked about previously. For mental health services, again, the, these are permanent changes. For other services, this is effective through 1231 of 2024. We will need to watch the proposed and final rule for 2025. CMS is looking at data. They're also looking at information submitted by the provider community in order to, to, to determine whether or not some of these procedure codes um, will continue as telehealth in the future. So the next thing that we have then is the place of service code. For services in 2024, you want to use the place of service code, either 02 or 10, in order to identify that your service is telehealth. The 10 is the patient's home, and 02 is any place else. So you would use an 02 for an office, for an inpatient, for a skilled nursing facility, it's just anywhere other than home. You don't need to append modifier 95 to the service itself, except for that exception that's listed there at the bottom. When the practitioner is located in the hospital and they're providing services to a patient in their home, then they would use the place of service code 21 and they would append modifier 95 for that. In addition to that, um, CMS has changed the payment to a non-facility payment for place of service code 10. Um, we are aware that there is a system alert available on our website that shows that this payment has not been at the non-facility rate. They are working on that, working with CMS to get that corrected. Um, once that is corrected, then that system alert that's available on our website 
will be updated in order to show exactly what has happened with that. These are the practitioners that can provide telehealth services. The non-physician practitioner list also includes the marriage and family therapist and the mental health counselors. It also includes registered dietitians. We had a, a pre-submitted question and I wasn't real for sure what the question meant, but the question was, can a non-physician practitioner provide telehealth services in Indiana? Um, and as far as Medicare is concerned, yes, they can, but you also wanna be sure you're checking with your states to see if there's any restrictions um, for the, uh, other than an MD or a DO. The next thing that we have is for a resident providing uh, telehealth services. And again, there's no geographic restrictions. It's available in all teaching settings. Teaching physicians, of course, must supervise, but that can include audio and video supervision. Re uh, under the teaching physician guidelines, it does need to, that teaching physician needs to be present during the key and critical portions of a service. Now for an evaluation and management service, that's pretty much the whole service. Um, if there are other services that that resident is providing, that teaching physician then would determine what is the key and critical portion. And this is effective through 1231 of 2024. And for the teaching physician guidelines, or under the teaching physician guidelines, you would need to append that modifier GC. And of course, this would uh, require audio video presence or can do audio video presence by that teaching physician. So I want you to think about what that means. That means that the patient is in a location, the resident is in another location, the teaching physician is in another location. All three of those entities and those people need to be able to see each other and hear each other. And this is under the teaching physician guidelines. Now we have information for you here on a resident service outside of an MSA. And it tells you that the teaching physician can be present virtually when services are provided outside of an MSA and you can use the modifier GC. Well, CMS, and, and you know, we told you CMS rules change often. Well, they have updated this information since we had our presentation go through our review and approval process. In that MLN, the 901-705, and again, it's in your resources section, it now says that for a resident, Medicare can allow the virtual supervision in all locations. It doesn't have, it no longer has to be an area outside of an MSA. We provided you with a definition of what an MSA is, so you can take a look at that. Under the teaching physician guidelines, we have primary care exception. And this allows the resident to see that patient without the teaching physician being physically within that room. Teaching physician must not have any other responsibilities and they cannot supervise more than four residents. And then you see the modifier there, GE, that is appended to that uh, particular service. Well, under the primary care exceptions, the location where that resident is located, their time, their salary, their fringe benefits have to go toward the graduate medical education program. The teaching physician must be immediately available. And again, that sentence outside of an MSA can be virtual. CMS has now changed that and it is all locations can be virtual. And it does have to be audio video. 
So when I'm picturing this, I'm picturing the resident uh, going in to see that patient in the room. They're then coming out of that room. They're accessing that teaching physician through the audio video communication system. They're talking about that patient's care. And then the teaching physician is providing any information that resident needs to have. And then that last bullet point, the patient sees that center as their primary source of health care. So then now we're going to talk about mental health services, and this is permanent. Um, the changes that have been made to this are permanent. Patient's home is an acceptable place of service. There's no geographic restriction. Under the mental health services provision, the diagnosis information is going to be a substance use disorder with co-occurring co mental health disorder or the diagnosis, evaluation, or treatment of a mental health disorder. This is not based on the procedure code. This is going to be based on the diagnosis code that you are submitting to Medicare. So what I mean by that is that you could have an evaluation and management service, let's say a 99213, but that 99213 is being used to treat substance use disorder with co-occurring mental health disorder or diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of a mental health disorder. Then for telehealth, it falls under the mental health services instructions as opposed to the other instructions. So your diagnosis code will be the determinant of whether it is a mental health service or not. We do have a mental health encore presentation. In fact, Mary Muko, my colleague on this call today, completed that back in November of 2023. And so we have provided you with the link to that um, mental health telehealth presentation. So you can go take a look at that if you choose to. For 2024, Medicare has removed the frequency uh, requirements of some services that can be provided through telehealth. Prior to this, there was restrictions on how often inpatient hospital services, skilled nursing facilities, or uh, critical care consults could be provided through telehealth. And that is no longer, again, through the end of 2024. There is still a frequency limitation, though, for the end stage renal disease services, and this is that monthly assessment service. So you can see there the patient's going to be receiving home dialysis. They have to receive a face to face service monthly in the case of the initial three months of home dialysis. And then after that, at least once every three consecutive months after that, those first three months. The next thing that we have then is talking about physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech language pathology. This can apply for both independent practice and hospital based practices. They will continue to. Uh, to allow as telehealth through the end of this year, 2024. Outpatient hospitals no longer have to register that patient's home as a practice location. In this situation, these providers will still submit the modifier 95 with the exception of the critical access hospital, the method two. We also have information on the diabetes self-management training and the medical nutritional therapy training. Both of these can be independent practice or hospital-based, and then the same rules apply. Outpatient hospitals don't have to register that patient home, and these providers would submit the modifier 95, other than the critical access hospital method two. 
Incident two services um, can also, the supervision requirements for that can also be met through audio video communication. Take a look at that third bullet point though, that physician or practitioner who is providing that supervision must be immediately available. And it is through audio video communication. So that means that physician, uh, while they're not necessarily in the office on that day, they can't be in the middle of a surgery um, in, in the middle of something else where they're not immediately available to the person who's actually providing that service. Immediately, you know, the definition of that means right now. Um, you know, they have to be able to provide the assistance to the person providing that incident to service um, and be immediately available to affect that patient's care should that person need their input. So the direct supervision, again, is, needs to be through audio video communication. That doesn't mean that you have to have that supervising practitioner on audio video in the patient's room. The person providing the service can actually step out of the room, access that physician through the audio video communication, and then go back into the room with that patient. And then, of course, you do need to meet all of the other incident to guidelines. We did provide a webinar um, last week, I think it was, on incident two. And if the Encore presentation is not either on our Encore page or in our YouTube channel, it will be there within the next week. Other direct supervision services, and what we're talking about here are those things listed in the Medicare physician fee schedule relative value file that require direct supervision. Some of these can be, um, there are some radiology services, um, some heart procedures, that type of thing, that require direct supervision. Through the use of 20, or through the end of 2024, this also can be audio video, video communication. For rural health clinics and federally qualified health clinics, they can continue to provide telehealth services. Again, the patient can be located at any site. You can see that procedure code there, the G2025, for mental health services provided by telehealth, no longer applies. And we did include a statement on virtual communication services, the G0071, um, will no longer include online E&M provided to an established patient. And so what we're talking about there is that the payment for those online E&M services is no longer part of that G0071. We did a presentation um, yesterday on the uh, E&M services through online digital um, encounters or experiences. This again will be available on our Encore page and in our YouTube channel within the next two weeks. The patient does need to provide consent for those services that do require direct supervision. So for RHCs and FQHCs, that's a separate consent rather than the overall consent that you have the patient sign so that you can release information to Medicare. The modifier CR, you can see they're ended 511 of 23. That's when the public health emergency ended. Now, modifier CR is for emergencies. So if you are part of um, a declared emergency, such as wildfires in California or Texas, or hurricanes in Mississippi or Louisiana, the instructions may be to submit that CR on your claims if you're part of that situation. But for the um, telehealth services and as part of the public health emergency, that uh, use of that modifier ended as of 511. 
the modifier GT is used by cause when they are acting as the distant site practitioner. And then we have some mental health modifiers. We have the FQ, which is when those services are being provided through real-time two-way audio only communication. We have modifier 93, again, when the services are being provided audio only, you would use the place of service code 02 or 10 for that. And then for modifier 95, you can see there that it's not normally used after 511. However, there are some exceptions to that that we previously talked about, and that's the outpatient therapy services provided by telehealth by the PTs, OTs, and LCLPs through the end of this year. And then, of course, we also mentioned the uh, diabetes self-management training and then the medical nutritional therapy. We do still have the audio-only services, the 99441 to 443, and these are still available um, as of right now through the end of 2024. The provider must have audio video capabilities. Now, again, I want to remember, we want to separate this from mental health services. If you're providing a mental health service through audio only, there are different instructions for that. And you would use your actual procedure codes as opposed to these telephone codes. But if it's not for mental health, then again, the provider has to be able to do audio video. The patient either does not have, doesn't want to use, or cannot use video for some reason. And then of course the patient can be in their home. So that's the information that we have available for you on um, telehealth. I do have two pre-submitted questions before we dive into the rest of them. One of the pre-submitted questions says, or asks, does everybody in the room need to be documented? If you bill under someone that is providing the service, either um, telehealth or teaching, you want to have documentation to support the service. So if they're in the room, then that needs to be in the documentation. If you're providing it through telehealth, you need to document how that telehealth is being provided. If you have someone just observing the service for whatever reason, but not participating and not going to bill for that, then no, we don't have to have that documentation. Another pre-submitted question is, are the documentation requirements different? Well, the only difference is you're, you would tell us within the medical record that the service is being done telehealth. Now, that also includes for the mental health services, if you're doing that audio only, that information would be within your medical record. But other than that, you just have to have the documentation to support the service you did. So that's the two pre-submitted questions I had. I'm gonna turn it over to Mary um, to see the questions we have in the chat. Thanks, Ellen. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about place of service, Ellen, um, specifically 19, 22, and 21. Uh, physician APP is in the hospital. Um, typically, that would mean at 19, 22, or 21. Patient is at home. The comments I'm receiving is that the MLN article is confusing. And so providers or those on learners on this call would like some clarification as to when to use place of service 19, 22, or 21 with modifier 95, or when to use place of service 02 or 02, I should say, and 10. Okay, in the MLN, the specific, um, uh, the way that they have worded that is if the doctor is located within the hospital, and it does not say inpatient hospital, outpatient hospital, it just says hospital, 
then you would use, and the patient is located within their home, then you would use places service code 21 and append modifier 95. So if your doctor is in the outpatient department of the hospital, and you would, if you had an in-person service, you would have billed a 19 or a 22. If the patient is located within their home, you are going to submit the place of service code 21 and then the modifier 95. Next question. All right, next question is asking you to review telehealth consents again. Okay, for, for telehealth services, you want to make sure that you have consent to, to provide services to your patient, okay? And that's, you know, what you do when the patient comes in for the first time. It allows you to receive payment from Medicare. The information the patient signs then allows you to release information to Medicare. What Medicare has said for telehealth services is that you don't have to have a special consent. So your last service with the patient was in person. This service today is gonna to be telehealth. You don't have to have a special consent for this service to provide it through telehealth. If it is a service that requires specific consent, um, and off the top of my head, the, the couple of ones I can think of that require that special consent, um, uh, chronic care management, for an example, you wouldn't provide through telehealth. Transitional care management may be one that would apply because you do, it's a 30 day service and you do have to have consent for that. So if transitional care management is on the list of telehealth services, um, and transitional care management requires a special consent, then you would have to have that special consent in order to do that service through telehealth. But it's the consent for the service as opposed to consent for telehealth. Next question. All right, when a college student is in their dorm room, is that considered their home? Yes, it is. Next question. Can a neural optometrist perform telehealth? If a neuro optometrist has or can bill Medicare and the procedure code that they're billing to Medicare is on the telehealth list, then the answer to that is yes. Next question. Next question is uh, regarding the use of modifier 95, the learner is asking, did you state that modifier 95 is no longer needed after 511 of 23, except when stated in guidelines? That is correct. So it, we talked about some of the um, weirdness, I guess you could say is a good word. Um, when modifier 95 would be used, and if you don't fall under one of those situations, then no, you do not use modifier 95. You'll use the 02 or the 10 place of service code. Next question. Right, and I just want to add, Ellen, for behavioral health services, there is no using, not, uh, there is, we no longer use the 95 or ask you to append the 95 after 511 of 23. So sometimes different rules for behavioral health, mental health versus other services. Right. Uh, next question, uh, what if the telehealth for mental health services you do audio video, what modifier do you use if you are in an FQHC? Um, if you, well, you would use the, the modifiers that we have um, on page 32 of your document, which is that FQ modifier or the modifier 93, if you're doing those services audio only. If you're doing, um, mental health services, let me look here. Um, if you're doing mental health services through telehealth for an RHC or FQHC, you and, unless it meets modifier FQ or 93, you wouldn't append a modifier. Next question. Okay. 
this learner is needing clarification on location of the provider site. If the provider is working from home rather than the office, are you saying that the provider must have their home address registered with Medicare in order to complete the telehealth visit? That is correct. Providers have to have all of their practice locations enrolled with Medicare. Now, if it's a one-off situation, I'm, you know, I'm going to see this patient through telehealth and, it, you know, I, I need to be in my home for some reason today, and that's not a situation that's going to happen again, then no. But if it's an ongoing situation where your provider is doing services out of their home, they must enroll that location as a practice location. Next question. Is there a time frame during the pandemic that Medicare will not audit telehealth services? Uh, the answer to that is no. All services by Medicare are subject to um, CMS review, either through contractor or through the uh, MAC itself, through other contractors, through the Office of the Inspector General. Um, so yes, Medicare can review everything. Next question. Thanks. For enrollment, does the group need to be enrolled with the MAC where the provider is located or where the patient who's receiving the treatment is located? You have to be enrolled where the practitioner is providing service. So let's say that you have um, a, a clinic in Kansas and you have a doctor that's part of that clinic that moves to Texas, and but they're still going to provide services to the patients from that Kansas clinic that provider is either gonna to have to enroll as an individual provider or your group is gonna to have to enroll with the Texas Medicare Administrative Contractor. Okay. If the patient is inpatient hospital, but the provider is located elsewhere that day, the provider would normally be at the hospital, but would they use place of service 02 for telehealth and our usual hospital subsequent day CPT code? That is correct. Thank you. Can telehealth be billed when a patient is on vacation or at a secondary residence in a state other than Michigan? The provider is located in Michigan. Sure. Um, the patient can be located anywhere. The, the one thing that you want to kind of look at is what is the license agreements between the state where, there, where that patient is located and then your state. There could be reciprocal agreements. Um, you know, you could talk to the state licensing board and, and you know, you're telling them this is kind of a one-off situation. I'm licensed in Michigan, but you would have to work with that particular state. Next question is, if modifier 95 is appended when the place of service is 0, 2, or 10, uh, and the modifier is not needed, will this result in a denial? Um, I don't believe it will result in a denial, but you don't want to bill your claim incorrectly. So if modifier 95 is not required, then don't append it on your claim. Right. Next question, where can I find what MAC a specific state is under? So is there a directory for the MACs? Yes. If you go onto the CMS website, and this is not in your resource section, but if you go onto the CMS website and you do a search for MAC maps, what will come back, probably the first or second one, um, we'll show you the jurisdictions and each of the different contractors that cover those jurisdictions. All of the MACs, their jurisdictions are multiple states. Um, so for an example, WPS, we have jurisdiction five and eight, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri, and then Indiana and Michigan. If you are located in Texas, for an example, that's Novitas. And there's a, a whole lot of states that go along with Novitas's jurisdiction. But you can do a search on the CMS website, MAC Maps, and then that'll bring that information back. Next question. 
All right, Ellen, I'm looking through the questions. Many of them appear to be uh, duplicative. Uh, let's see. Are the telephone services 99441 through 99443 only applicable when the patient does not have or cannot use video? Correct. It, you're doing an audio only service with that patient. And in order to use those, the provider has to have audio video capability, but either the patient um, does not have it, they can't figure out how to use it. And frankly, I don't, my granddaughter has to show me how to do it on my phone, um, or they simply will not. Um, and you would need to document that within your within your records. So that's going to be the last question that we take for today. If there's anything else within the chat, uh, we will be able to um, respond to those later. Go on to the next. The next thing that we have then are the resources for you. Um, so you can see we've got the MLN listed there. Uh, list of telehealth services. We did provide you with the hhs.gov website also. I would just caution you a little bit. I was out there looking at that the other day. There are some discrepancies there between that and what has been published on the CMS website. We've got a link there for you about licensing across state lines. Uh, a special edition for RHCs and FQHCs. We provided that physician compare link so that if your doctors are practicing out of their home, you can go and see what address is actually being displayed there. Um, the uh, services or the links that we have on the top are really kind of that transition between the public health emergency and then following that. And then the last one on this page, the uh, chapter 12, section 190, really is all of the telehealth information. So on behalf of Mary and myself, we wanna thank you very much for your attendance today. We really do encourage you to take that survey. I, I understand I've mentioned that word several times just within the past minute. Um, we do want your feedback. If there are ways that you believe I can improve my presentation to you, I want to know about that. If you think this pre uh, presentation was fantastic, thank you for that, and I want to know about that too. So on behalf of Mary and I, we want to again thank you for attending and have an absolute wonderful day. You can now disconnect.